Hello you guys, welcome back to my channel. My name is Rick, if you haven't been here before, welcome. So today we're going to be talking about Hulu's Only Murders in the Building, episode seven, Valley of the Dolls. And this is a continuation of a series I've been doing for a while. So I have every episode of, well, almost every episode of season four, three, two, and one. So if you are not all caught up or you haven't seen past videos, Make sure to go back, check them out before you watch this one because I talk about a lot of other clues. I talk full spoilers, so if you haven't seen the episode, definitely don't watch this. Um, so just want you to be aware there will be spoilers if you are not all caught up. And if I reference another theory that I've talked about, it's probably one of my past videos. And if I remember, I will make sure to put it up above so you can check that out. Before we get into the video, make sure to hit that like button, subscribe, hit the bell notification, all that good YouTube stuff. I'm trying to hit 2,000 subscribers by the end of the year. And every time you like, comment, subscribe, share with a friend who also likes Only Murders in the Building or any of my other content, it really helps. And um, it just helps promote the video and push it further for the YouTube algorithm. So literally everything you guys do is so helpful. And if you're already subscribed, I love you so much. Thank you so much for subscribing. So let's get into the video, season four, episode seven, Valley of the Dolls. Now, once again, this is another movie. So the episode's referencing a movie. Every episode this season has referenced a movie. And from what I can tell, Valley of the Dolls, I've never seen it, is a movie about three young women in show business who end up befriending each other and who it kind of follows their lives. And later on, they end up spiraling with drug abuse and alcoholism. And um, so it's really kind of a tragedy, a sad story following these girls and what happens to them after they've entered show business, which is maybe a reference to the fact that we are in a season that talks a lot about Hollywood and being on TV and being in movies and the toxicity of that environment. It's possible that this will have to do with reasons why the killer is the way they are because of the toxicity of Hollywood. And, you know, maybe it's supposed to show the negative sides of Hollywood and like what it does to people. Once again, we have a narrator who we don't know at the beginning of the episode. This doesn't happen a lot, I would say, but it's happened more this season where we'll have a narrator and they either A, won't tell us who the narrator is, we kind of find out on our own, or B, they don't tell us until like the end of the episode. So the person starts out, they're talking and we're like, we don't even know who this is. The trio is escaping the city because the killer was watching them. We obviously found secret hidden cameras in Oliver's apartment. And so they decide to go to Charles's sister's house to escape New York City and get out of the line of fire. Oliver ends up dumping Loretta over text because of the fact that he feels like he bared his soul trying to propose to her and she responded, Aww. And so he's decided he's just gonna, he's so heartbroken, he's just gonna move on and he's gonna dump her over text. The trio also calls Howard to let them know that if they disappear, it that they're actually in Long Island visiting Charles' sister and to please not tell anybody. So they arrive at Charles' sister's house and she is played by Melissa McCarthy, which we knew this was coming. She's been in a lot of the branding, like even their main poster. Um, she's in the main po on the main poster in one of the little film boxes. So we knew she was going to be a part of this season and we've kind of been waiting for this moment. And then we flash to the opening credits and we see that everyone in the opening credits, Charles, Oliver, and Mabel all have pigtails. And our first thought is, does this have to do with Helga and the scratched out face in the photo from the Westies from Vince's apartment? So we're keeping an eye out for pigtails this episode and what does this mean for us? And this is also another reference to pigs. So we go into the house, it's full of dolls and Oliver says to, I think her name's Doreen. Oliver says to Doreen, oh, it seems like you've replaced your daughters with dolls. And she says to him, oh my God, I never connected those two dots. You're such an intuitive man. And um, she starts 
to, to hit on him, to give Oliver a little bit of attention. We learn that she's married to Big Mike, who is her cop husband, and he's currently kicked out sleeping in the boat in their driveway. He's not living in the house right now. We also learn that Charles inflicted a permanent injury on Doreen, but we don't initially know what that injury was. And later on, we learn that Doreen lost her spleen in a swing accident, where Charles was pushing her and she went flying off and apparently her spleen came flying out. So that's something. And we also learn that Charles is probably like, I want to say like 15 years older than Doreen. She says that she was pretty young, maybe five, and he was 19 um, when the accident happened and around that time. So it seems like he's, they've got a pretty significant age gap over 10 years. Oliver and Charles end up leaving all of the casework to Mabel. Oliver's heartbroken because of the whole situation with Loretta and Charles is trying to keep them all safe and he is desperately trying to nail windows shut. So they stay over. The next day, Bev arrives and she lets the trio know that Howard told her where they would be. So Howard is not keeping the secret very well. And she says that the movie might be killed if the brothers, sisters are the killers, she'll have to fire them. And so she's basically asking Charles, are they murderers or are they not? He says, no, they're not the murderers. And she ends up calling the production agency and telling them that Charles is like 60% sure that the brothers, sisters are not the killers. Mabel is actually trying to get some work done, but Oliver is actually trying to get drunk. So we have Oliver running around looking for some sort of booze. Bev comes in and she tells Mabel that they're all fucking dead. And immediately Mabel's like, is someone outside? Are we in danger? And Bev's like, no, the studio is just about to pull the plug on the movie and it's a catastrophe. Bev is very upset about this. We have Doreen who is currently hitting on Oliver at the bar. She's making him a sweaty Betty, which is apparently just vodka and crystal light. Oliver tells Doreen about his troubles with Loretta and says that he feels that he's too emotionally available, that he's too open, and that's why Loretta doesn't want to be with him anymore, or that's his like theory, um, which is funny because like having a emotionally available man is like every girl's like dream problem because the whole stereotype is that men are emotionally unavailable. And so Doreen is like very into the fact that Oliver is like, oh, I'm so emotionally available. Like, oh, and Doreen's like, oh my gosh, that's, I want. <laughs> Next, we have the actors who arrive. They knock on the door, Zach comes in and they are like, way to leave us behind. You're just okay with the murderer killing us. Mabel tells the actors that she doesn't feel like they were ever the target. And Zach says that he has a gut feeling that the actors actually are the target and then he pulls up his shirt to show his bullet wound. Now we know that Zach wasn't the intended, at least well, we assume that Zach wasn't the intended victim because he wasn't even directly shot. The bullet only hit him when it bounced off of Glenn's plate in his head. So Zach technically wasn't directly shot at all, but I guess, I guess for the sake of argument, we don't technically no, but we're pretty sure that either Glenn or Oliver was the target here. The next person to arrive is Loretta and she comes in just as Oliver and Doreen are starting to bond. Doreen puts Oliver's arm around her and then when the door bell goes off, she gets up to get it. Oliver also gets up and they trip and he falls on top of her and that is when Loretta walks in. Loretta and Oliver end up going to sit together to talk about why he felt that he could break up with her over text. She flew six hours just to talk to him in person and she's clearly very upset. And they realize that Oliver actually never spoke to Loretta. What happened was he called and they gave the phone to her stunt double. So this is another double. And she, they're both wrapped up in gauze, so you can't tell who's who on set. And so he actually spoke to Loretta's stunt double, who was like, mm, mm, because the stunt double didn't know who he was. So Loretta never heard any of the things he said, like never got to speak to him. And that is where all this confusion has come from. We see that Charles and Doreen are still fighting about the spleen accident. And she says that she's just joking and that he's taking it way too seriously. 
And she talks about seeing him in one of his first ever plays when she was five and how their mom held her hand. And he is ignoring her because he's trying to get this nail into the window to make sure that they're safe. And they basically fight because she says he's not paying attention to her. And he says that he's not trying to yell at her. She ends up leaving the room and saying that Oliver appreciates how emotional she is, unlike Charles, who's trying to get her to stop. The actors spend their time in the house bothering Mabel, and she basically tells them to get lost and asks Loretta to please come and take them away. Meanwhile, Loretta has come into the kitchen and is saying hi to Eugene, who she met in Saskatoon in 82 but he doesn't remember her. She mentions that they did a stage adaptation of James Bond's Moonbreaker, and she was Lieutenant Holly Goodhead. Moonraker, not Moonbreaker, Moonraker. And apparently the plot of this movie is basically that James Bond is investigating a theft happening on a global space shuttle and discovers a plot for a global genocide to take place. So I haven't seen the movie, but apparently that's what it's about. I don't see any like direct parallels to how it would be related to this, but it's funny that Loretta is saying that she knows Eugene Levy and he's basically like, I don't know you, I don't know who you are. And I do wonder if this is at all a reference to like, did Loretta and Eugene have a relationship during that time? Is he the father to, to one of her children? Like. Um, there are some questions since that was like so long ago, but I don't think that's the reference or like the tie-in. I think it was just something that they threw in there for Eugene Levy to be like, I'm this big actor and I don't know who you are. And for Loretta to be like, remember me? Loretta suggests that we will actually allow the actors into the case because they know the human condition better than anyone else because they study it in order to be great actors. Then Bev shows up. She's drunk and Mabel asks Bev to entertain the actors now because she's like really not into the idea of them helping with the case. Bev says that she will totally do that but then she actually tells all of the actors to go fuck themselves and she says that she's so tired of this movie, she's so stressed out, there's so many plot holes in the storyline and she tells Zach to stop complaining about the fact that he's been shot. As she's walking away, the actors make some assessments about that she's a middle child and that she's got a high thyroid and she ends up yelling back that they're all correct, like, oh, three out of three. And Mabel decides, actually, okay, the actors have this ability to analyze people deeper than, you know, what's on the surface. So Mabel decides that they actually would be really helpful to have in the case. So she goes on to explain the whole case to them and get them all caught up. And at this point, I guess we can assume that the actors are not the killers because they are, you know, it's episode seven. They've showed up to the house. They're afraid that they're going to be killed and Mabel is letting them in on the case, which technically is a big faux pas because they could still be suspects. But for now, it looks like Bev and the actors are not the guilty party. And this episode is definitely focusing more on making the Westies look guilty. Now it's Howard's job to figure out who has been cashing the checks at the local bodega. So he goes into the bodega to speak to the guy and the guy's like, I cannot show you our ledger. I can't show you any like footage of, from the security camera. And Howard's like, how about I put your guard cat on my new podcast? And the guy's all in, he's ready to talk to Howard. And as he's looking through the ledger, he actually sees that there are a bunch of different signatures for Dudenoff. So it seems like there are a bunch of different people cashing these checks. Um, Howard ends up calling Mabel to tell her, but Mabel is still explaining the case to the actors. So she's busy, she's not answering. Doreen enters the room to seduce Oliver and she comes out in these like pigtail braids that she's attached to her head. And she ends up calling Loretta Heidi and pulling her pigtails and they kind of get into a little scuffle, but Loretta's like, okay, you know what, I'm gonna let it go. And Loretta asks Oliver what he told her double when he called because clearly it was something very emotional. And he basically admits that because he was afraid of losing her, he was going to propose to her the night that they were both in LA and that he is actually Ronnie. He has his Finsta, which obviously he's gotten rid of since this point, but that he was Ronnie. He was the one messaging Loretta 
And she gets really upset, obviously, because she feels like she had a real connection with Ronnie. She told Ronnie things, and this is a huge invasion of her privacy. So she ends up saying that she needs a minute and calling Oliver crazy. We also see that behind Oliver and Loretta, while they're having this conversation, there is a there is some music on the piano stand, and it's called Rumpus Room. And I looked this up, and there's a lot of different songs called rumpus room but it looks like the general idea is that a rumpus room is affiliated with a lot of like craziness and chaos which would make sense in this situation because loretta is literally accusing oliver of being crazy so after that loretta's on her own she's deleting memes that ronnie sent her because you know she's just so upset and doreen comes in to apologize and tell loretta that you know, Oliver's not crazy. He just has a lot of feelings. And Loretta and Doreen end up getting into an argument and then a physical altercation. And they literally fight each other. Loretta stops and pretends to have a pacemaker. And Doreen is like, oh my god, I didn't know, I didn't know. And then Loretta kicks Doreen in the face and everyone rushes to stop the fighting. So once the women are finally separated, Charles takes Doreen into a separate room to help bandage the bite she has on her wrist or the scratch and he says he's worried about her and that he doesn't like the joking about the spleen thing because that was a really bad day for him and his mom basically screamed at him the whole time they were in the hospital and Doreen says that their mom was bonkers and talks about how seeing the play is such a special memory for her because of the fact that their mom held her hand when she was walking in to go see Charles and so it's very clear that they had a very unemotional and like closed mother and they kind of bond over the fact that, you know, she was very distant and then she was gone. And Doreen says that then Charles was gone too and that she really misses him. They kind of come to a conclusion of like, I'm going to come visit you more. I really do care about you. Um, so there's kind of a conclusion there. Bev runs in and she tells everyone that the studio gave permission for the movie to go full speed ahead after she like screamed at them for two hours and Loretta and Oliver talk and she also says that he might be crazy but that she does still love him. And then she proposes to him with a bracelet that she pulled off of a doll and he accepts. First he asks if um, there's any family money which makes them both burst into hysterical laughing and they, you know, he says yes. The next day, the actors wake the trio up to tell them that they have a murder wall and they know a little bit more about who the murderer is. So this is something that I talked a lot about last episode and I'm sure it was pretty evident to a lot of people, but it's really fun to see it being confirmed. And so basically the actors go on to point out that the Killer is not from this season, but is actually from season one. And they're talking about the podcast, but for us, it's funny because we know that they, that there's also a season one of the TV show. So we're thinking who from season one could be the killer. And basically the actors point out that someone poisoned Winnie and they never looked into it, that there was the I'll end you note on Oliver's door and they never looked into that. Um, that Jan couldn't possibly have written that note because she is not left-handed and the person who wrote that note is left-handed. And that Jan got an I'm watching you note and that is the same text message that they received two days ago when they were in New York City and figured out that they were being filmed. So basically they're kind of saying that they think someone else poisoned Winnie, that they think all of these things that were kind of pushed aside or pushed under the rug are actually a killer from season one. And it's funny because when season one was over, I was making videos about this series and I was upset because I felt like there were a lot of plot holes that were not being filled in. I was like, okay, it was a great season. I loved the show, but what about all the notes? And what about this? And what about that? So the actors have finally called that out and we're having a full circle moment from season one all the way up until now, we're filling in some of those plot holes. So Charles stands up and says, oh my gosh, like Saz must have known. That's why she wrote Sick Pup because she was talking about Winnie. That's why she wrote Door Notes because she was talking about the notes on their doors in season one. And um, 
they kind of side cut and Charles is like, Oliver, why are you so happy? Like, there's been a murder after us for three years. And Oliver is like, well, this bitch is getting married. So he's completely out of it. So finally, we get to the end of the episode and the trio are sitting outside on the boat with Doreen and we see Big Mike come up and we realize that he is the narrator for this episode. And he ends up mentioning um, a bottle of red, a bottle of white, which is from the song Scenes from an Italian Restaurant by Billy Joel. And this is a song about like two old friends meeting and kind of like talking about people from like their past and their high school and this one couple specifically who like was together in high school ended up getting married and then ended up getting divorced because they just like weren't a good match. So that's something interesting to like keep in mind. Another reference to a unhappy couple who end up getting divorced or where there's like not there's something wrong in the bond there. And that's something that I've talked about in a couple of past episodes is this reference to unhappy couples. So we learn that Howard somehow got Big Mike's number and is telling him that the Westies are actually the ones who have been cashing Dudnoff's checks. And we flash to Howard and we see him watching the security footage and one after the other Westie keeps coming in and he decides to call the phone number and it goes straight to Vince Fish. And he says, you know, Milton Dudnoff, how can I help you? And Howard recognizes the voice and realizes that the Westies know and are cashing the checks. So they must know that Dudnoff is either not around anymore or that he's dead and was murdered long ago. And they have been cashing the checks ever since, which makes them look extremely suspicious. And so this is where we get into the theories portion of today's video. Um, I will say like there were less and less clues this episode than last because I think things have started sort of like started to fall into place for us. So first of all, we've got the fact that we think that the Westies may have killed Milton Dudinoff and therefore may be the murderer from season one. I do not think that the Westies are the murderers. I think that it's going to be discovered that they did know about Dudinoff's death, but they didn't know that he was murdered or they found him dead and so they threw him into the incinerator. I think that they know that he's dead, but they also knew that if they let anyone else know that he was dead, their rent, screw their rent scheme would end and they would have to move or pay full price or they would get in trouble. So they decided the best thing to do was to have Dudnoff leave the country and pretend like he was still alive in order to continue the rent scheme going. And that's how they can continue to cash the checks, get a little bit of money on the side. But I don't think that they are the murderers. I think it's too obvious. The whole next episode is going to be all about the Westies and, you know, accusing them of being murderers. And I just don't think it's them. Which means that if the Westies aren't the murderers and the actors aren't the murderers and, and Howard's not the murderer, we're getting pretty low on who the murderer could be. And so this is why I think that the murderer is Glenn. And the reason I think the murderer is Glenn is because he had his moment to narrate an episode, but we didn't actually learn anything about him. So he's one of the only main major characters this season who we know next to nothing about. We also know that he's crazy because he sees rats and he tries to stomp them. And we know that Rats has affiliation with the last season, and that's how Ben Glenroy died. So I really believe that Glenn Stubbins is the murderer. And either, one, he is Ben Glenroy, and he's trying to get revenge for his death or for them allowing him to die. And he is, like, facing a lot of trauma from that, and he maybe doesn't even know that he's Ben Glenroy. Like... Whatever the situation is, he somehow survived, somehow lived, and has made it here and is now trying to get revenge. And he is an actor. He is someone who could have known Dudna from the start. He is someone who knew Charles a long, long time ago when he was on set and he didn't like him. They fought. So it would kind of make sense if he had some sort of negative experience with Dudnoff, murdered him, got away with it, and then years down the line, the trio end up creating a podcast about murders in the building. He gets wind of it, 
and he's actually around before we ever see him. Some people might think that that is unfair in terms of like, we never would have been able to catch him back back then because we didn't even know he existed. But there are a lot of people who live in the building that we've like met over time. So I really can't blame them for this setup if this is how it goes down. The other option is that Glenn Stubbins is not Ben Glenroy but does want revenge for the fact that Ben died because he was his other half, he helped him get jobs, and now, you know, he's kind of a stuntman without a face. And so that's been really hard on him and he wants revenge for the trio allowing Ben to die, not liking him in the first place. Um, we also know that it's possible that Glenn wanted to be an actor in the first place and that he had some sort of relationship with Dudenoff and so that he murdered Dudenoff years ago after Dudenoff said, you know, you're not good enough to be an actor, but maybe you could be like a stunt double or something. And so he took revenge for that. So that's kind of where my mind is at. I don't know if it's going to be two people. We've had a doubles theme all throughout this season and I do wonder if it is a red herring or whether it's going to turn up that like there really were two people. I think it's possible that someone actually shot Saz from close range and not from far away and that they somehow covered their tracks and made it look like it was a shooting from the other building, from the West building from the West Wing. But if there are two people, I feel like the second person who's most likely to be the killer would be like Bev Mellon. Someone who is in a relationship with Glenn slash Ben, who is willing to put their life on the line to assist with his nefarious deeds, like a romantic partner. And I think Bev would be a good option for that. She also seems like she's crazy. Um, so for now, that's kind of what I'm looking at. I don't think it's the Westies. I do really, really think it's Glenn, but I'm really excited to see where the season goes and what else we get out of it. We've literally got three more episodes. I'm so excited to find out, I don't know, this story that's going to wrap up not just this season, but the first season with all these holes that were left that I'd been thinking, like, are they ever going to come back to this? And once season three came around, I was like, I guess we're just never going to talk about season one again. And here we are in season four talking about season one. So I am so excited. I hope you guys liked this video. If you did, make sure to hit that like button, subscribe, hit the bell notification, all that good YouTube stuff. Thank you guys so much for watching. And if you're already subscribed, you guys are absolutely the best. Make sure to comment down below who you think the killer is. I wanna know all your theories, your thoughts. It's my favorite thing to read through and comment back and let you know what I think. I will see you guys next week with another video about Hulu's only murders in the building. Bye guys.